Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. All right, lift your Bible in the air. Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible Word. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But mark this. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy. Without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. God, I pray for your anointing over your word. God, I know this is your word. God, I watched as you opened it to me through this week. And God, it it was so sweet to see it happen. And God, to see how you did it, and, and uh, God, I'm, I'm amazed every week when you, you give your word to me, because I know I have nothing of my own. And God, when I see it open up before me, and God, you show me things in the scriptures that, for whatever reason, I've been a- unable to see before, and God, you show them to me and relate them to me in a way that I can understand. God, I pray that you'll help me to relay that message to this congregation. God, your word, not mine, to deliver it the way that you want it delivered. And God, that we receive it the way you want it received. God, that ultimately your will is done in every heart and every life. In Jesus' name, amen. In Leviticus 11, 44, God said, I am Yahweh, your God. God established who he was right, right, right away. I am Yahweh, and I am your God. I am the only God, and I am your God. So you must consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. For many American Christians, holiness conjures up musty images of old-time revival meetings and gospel trios and grandma and grandpa's old-time religion. Along with that mental image comes The thought of stern prohibitions against drinking and dancing and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Many Christians today are more than happy to leave those notions of holiness in the past. Yet, even in our era of techno-savvy megachurches and postmodern emerging churches, holiness, when it is discussed at all, is often associated with moral behavior. Things such as sexual purity or financial honesty and a commitment to private devotions and prayer. While we have cast off the old legalistic notions of holiness, we merely replace them with private moralistic notions. We act as if holiness is either outdated or it's something that only needs to characterize a small part of our Christian lives. Now, this is partly due to our quest for cultural relevance. Cultural relevance is an attempt to use methods or techniques in an approach that relates to everyone. Many modern Christians defend cultural relevance in the name of winning others into the kingdom of God. They they don't talk about sin. They, They don't require repentance. They just say, Jesus is our Savior. They think that if the church talks about holiness with unbelievers, it will just present another hurdle for them to overcome on their way to Christ. So for this and and several other reasons, some are rapidly forsaking our historic commitment to holiness. 
Recent polls show that self-described evangelicals march in moral lockstep with mainstream American culture in practices of divorce and spousal abuse and extramarital sex and pornography and alcoholism and materialism, just to name a few. While we tip our cap to the importance of holiness, many of the people outside of the church don't view modern Christians as morally different in any meaningful way, except to see us as hypocrites. I believe that a crucial step to healing our moral confusion is the recovery of the biblical idea of holiness. It's so much more than what we have turned it into. Holiness is the very life of God living in us and living through us. Holiness isn't just for ancient Christians, but it stands at the beginning and at the center of God's call on all of our lives because God says, be holy because I am holy. Some believe that all they need from God is forgiveness. We don't get to heaven as our final reward because we have been forgiven. Now listen to me. It wouldn't be enough to sustain us. It wouldn't grant us access into the presence of God because to be in the presence of God, we must be like God. And God is holy. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Forgiveness removes our sins, but it doesn't make us holy as God is holy. All right, now stay with me here. Stay with me here. When I think of holiness, I think of reverence. I think of consecration. When I think of holiness, I think of sanctity. When I think of holiness, I think of sinlessness and perfection and separation from the world. If I was being honest with you, I'd have to admit that when I think of holiness in the light of God's holiness, I'm also tempted to think of words like impossible and unattainable. So when God says that we are to be holy because he is holy, let's just say it makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I know that I'm not yet the man that God requires me to be. The first measure of our holiness is the law. Romans chapter 7, verse 12, the Apostle Paul refers to the law as being holy. So immediately I make a direct connection between holiness and following the law. But I know that I don't always follow the law, and I'm guilty under the law because I'm not always holy, and my inadequacy is, is reaffirmed. But then I read on in Romans chapter 8, and verse 2, that through Jesus Christ, I have been set free from the law, and I'm tempted to wonder if I really need to be holy, or if I'm exempt because of what Christ did. That's where some Christians live. They make no attempt at holiness because they still don't really understand holiness. They're not fully separated to God. Sin is still a part of their everyday life. On the outside, they profess to belong to God, but on the inside, they're still the same person they've always been. Like a painted grave, they're pleasing on the exterior, but on the inside, they're still filled with dead men's bones. So if I have asked God for forgiveness... And I have invited the Holy Spirit to live in me. Do I really need to be holy? Does God expect me to be perfect as he is perfect and holy as he is holy? Or am I just now under the blood and instantly pardoned by God for all of the sins that I purposely keep in my life and intentionally commit against him? As I read on the word of God in Romans 12, Paul comes back to this concept of holiness. He says, holiness is my reasonable service. In other words, he's saying that holiness is the least that I can do in response to what Jesus Christ has done for me. And now I find myself right back on the horns of a dilemma, torn between the holiness that God demands from me and the fallen flesh that still sometimes controls me. I sometimes wonder why God would frustrate me so as to demand that I live in a way that's foreign to me and so difficult for me to fulfill. Surely God knows that he has put unreasonable pressure on me with unreasonable expectations. But he still tells me that holiness is my reasonable service. So I suppose that I either need to do a better job at following the law, which is holy, or maybe I need to readdress how I view holiness. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 is a story of a Pharisee who invited Jesus over to his house for a meal. 
Now, this is an unusual invitation because the Pharisees hated Jesus. How many of you invite people you hate to your house for dinner? Don't, don't raise your hand. We might get into family problems here. The Pharisees hated Jesus, and yet this Pharisee invited Jesus over to his house for dinner. So when a Pharisee invites Jesus to his home for a meal, it becomes a headline story in the Bible. Pharisees were very procedural. They were very organized and structured. They did things methodically and ritually. From outward appearance, the Pharisee was the epitome of how many people typically view holiness. Pharisees wore a uniform. They looked the part that they played. Just looking at them, everybody knew that they were a Pharisee. Pharisees emphasized a commitment to social justice and a belief in the brotherhood of mankind and a faith in the redemption of the Jewish nation. They had a wonderful platform, but they had no convictions. You're following me. The Pharisees believed that their objectives would be achieved through halakha, The halakha was a corpus of laws and a commitment to relate religion to ordinary concerns in a daily life. Essentially, they were trying to be culturally relevant. So they were methodical and ritualistic in everything that they did. They were the epitome of an external religion. They dressed like a Pharisee, they walked like a Pharisee, they talked like a Pharisee, and they ate like a Pharisee. That's why the Pharisee was so surprised when Jesus didn't wash before the meal. Washing before a meal was a religious ritual. It's what religious people did. It's how godly people conducted themselves. It was the proper procedure. But here was Jesus coming to a meal who claimed to be the Son of God, who claimed to be the holiest of all, and he didn't even wash his hands before he ate. Pharisee was deeply offended. He was visibly upset. How could Jesus make the claims that he was making but fail to follow the accepted procedure? He was upset. But he's even more taken by Jesus' response to him because Jesus' response to him was offensive and severe. All throughout the Gospels, I never read where Jesus is impressed by anybody's attempts at outward holiness. But he always addressed the state of people's hearts. He could see past the outside. He could see deep down on the inside of a man's soul. He could discern righteousness from sin. He could sense the difference between someone who wanted to live for God and a hypocrite. Nobody could fool Jesus. Nobody could deceive him because Jesus could see into a man's heart. Jesus accused the Pharisee of having an outward appearance of holiness while his heart was full of greed and wickedness. Jesus then begins to proclaim to this Pharisee a bunch of woes. He said, woe to you Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. Woe to you Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you Pharisees, because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. Woe is the Hebrew word oya. From the word oi, you've heard Jewish people express themselves by saying, hoi, oi. That's where it comes from. It's a feeling of pain or sorrow or deep sadness. But when a woe is pronounced in the scriptures, it's much more severe. It is a warning of impending judgment without the opportunity for repentance. A woe is the instant judgment of God. Jesus was telling Pharisee, I see right through your disguise. And I'm not playing that game. You're a fake, and you know that you're a fake, and I know that you're a fake, and you're not going to pretend with me. You can fool a lot of people. You can fool your friends, and you can fool your family, and you can fool the people that you work with, and you can fool the people that you sit with in church. You can fool the elder board, and you can fool the pastor, but you will never fool God because God knows your heart. You can dress like a Christian and you can speak like a Christian and you can do all of the things that a good Christian is supposed to do, but God knows when you're a fake. He knows what's on the inside and there will come a day when God will expose you. Jesus called the Pharisee out for what they believed. He called them out for who they really were. Hypocrites don't like to be called out. 
They don't like it when they're exposed. They get angry and defensive when somebody pulls back the curtain and shows the world who they really are. They get furious when their true colors are exposed. Don't be fooled. They don't get hurt. They don't get offended. They don't get wounded. But like an old bulldog, they get mad. The sure sign when guilt is struck is anger. Pharisees were angry at Jesus because he called them out on their junk. He exposed their outward appearance for the disguise that it was because he exposed the sin that was in their heart. If we're going to reframe holiness, this seems like a really good place to start. Holiness is much more of an internal reality than it is an external one. It has nothing to do with rule keeping. Holiness isn't always evident in our actions. Certainly, holy actions come because of the position of our heart. But if we seek external holiness first, God is no more impressed with us than he was with the Pharisee. I don't have this all figured out completely. But as I draw more closely to Jesus, I see how he is more concerned about the motives of my heart than he is with the actions of my hands or the words of my mouth. I can choreograph my actions and I can rehearse my speech without ever having to change my heart. But God knows that when my heart is right, everything else will come naturally. I heard a a saying on the radio this week. I think it was by John Wooden. You know, it's basketball time of year. And he said that people should be more concerned about their character than they are about their reputation. Your reputation is what other people think of you, but your character is who you really are. When we first moved into our home in Continental nearly 21 years ago, even though we were thankful to God for our new house, we knew that there were some things in our home that we wanted to change. One of the things that needed to be changed was the ugly light blue pattern linoleum that was in our kitchen. You remember this stuff? It was chipped and cracked and dented and sliced. Some of it had come unglued and bubbled up. We'd throw rugs over it, but there weren't enough rugs to go around to cover up all of the, all of the problems. Now, it might have looked good in the past. There might have been a day when visitors came to the house and they were fooled into believing that it was imported Italian marble in a mosaic pattern. But those days were long gone. At the time, we didn't think that we could afford to replace it. We had four young children, and we only made $21,000 a year before taxes. So we spent what money we had on trivial things, things like food and clothes and electricity. We didn't want to pay the price, and we felt that we were unable to pay the price to do it right. We also knew that we didn't want to replace the piece of ugly linoleum that we had with a new piece of ugly linoleum. So we felt stuck. Have you ever felt stuck? You're unhappy with what you have, and you'd like to replace it, what you have, with something better, but you don't know how to make it happen. It seems unreachable and unattainable. The cost seems too high, and you don't have the first clue on how to make the change. That's how we felt about our ugly linoleum. And then somebody came along and invented laminate. Laminate. Do you remember when laminate first hit the shelves? Laminate was cheap. It was culturally relevant. Everybody could afford laminate, even us. And we started thinking, well, you know, we could get rid of the old linoleum and we could replace it with laminate and it would co- wouldn't cost us very much. We could do it ourselves without a whole lot of effort and we could, it would go down real fast and then life would be perfect. It was meant for us. So we bought some laminate. I tore out the old linoleum floor and I put down a floating laminate floor. It was a floating floor. It's supposed to be like walking on a cloud. You go in the kitchen, and it's a floating floor. I didn't have to be nailed down. It didn't have to, I didn't need anything real good underneath it. I could just lay it all over the old flaws and the stains. I didn't have, it didn't have to be permanent. If we changed our mind later on, we could just pick it up and throw it out and do something else. It was perfect. The problem was, 
that our laminate was just pieces of particle board with wood grain paper glued to it. There was nothing real about it. It was laminate. Nobody ever walked into our kitchen and say, I really loved your new wood floor. They might say, like your laminate. As it turned out, our laminate floor wasn't any better than the old linoleum, if it was even as good. It would dent and it would scratch, and then when somebody, uh, something heavy fell on it, pieces of the corners would break off. If somebody spilled something on it and we didn't clean it up right away, it would start to warp out of shape. One day I made the mistake of putting dish soap into the dishwasher, which seems like a sensible thing to me. Soon there was a two-foot deep souffle floating on the surface of our floating floor. And it was never the same after that. Some professing Christians are like my old kitchen floor. They're just like that ugly linoleum. They were new in the Lord 50 years ago, and they haven't become any more like Christ since. They've been what they've been all of their life, and they're not about to change for anybody. If there's going to be any change, they think that the church ought to be changed around them to complement them. They were ugly yesterday, and they will be ugly again tomorrow. They still come unglued in all the same places. They still get bent out of shape over the same old things. They still get worked up and trip up unsuspecting people who are walking by, and they decrease the value of everything around them. They want everybody to believe that they're imported Italian marble, but they're just nothing more than worn-out linoleum. During last Sunday's message, I said that some professing Christians are not more than carnal people covered with a veneer of Christ. Some Christians are like our old laminate floor. They just float along. They're not real. They're just junk on the inside covered with wall, the wallpaper of Christ. They might have torn out the old stuff and replaced it with new stuff, and the new stuff might look better and, than the old stuff, but the new stuff isn't any better than the old stuff. They might have changed some things and made some improvements, but everybody knows that they're not real. They only have a superficial appearance of Christ on the outside, but on the inside, they're still the same junk they've always been. In recent days, somebody has invented hardwood, a hardwood veneer floor. You seen these? Have you bought these? <laughs> Feeling guilty about the wrong stuff today, you know, aren't you? They've taken the concept of a laminate floor and they made a hardwood looking version of it. They've taken a thin sheet of plywood and they've covered it with a thin veneer of real hardwood. You can get it in cherry and bamboo and oak and mahogany. It's beautiful. When somebody looks at it, if they don't any bet, know any better, they're led to believe that this is the real thing. The selling point for this wood veneer is it will cost you less and you can easily and quickly install it yourself over any surface. The trouble is, it's still only a veneer, not the real thing. The flaws beneath the floor will eventually work their way to the top because there isn't enough strength in the veneer to stop them. If you spill something on it, eventually it'll get under the veneer and warp the wood. And if you drop something on it, it will chip away and expose the fake that's underneath. Because we have stopped pursuing true holiness, many have embraced a veneer Christianity. We're not holy. But we're carnal people covered with a veneer of Christ. Veneer Christianity comes in all forms. You can get it in traditionalist. You can get it in charismatic. You can get it in legalist. You can get it in Methodist and in Baptist in the church of God. It looks real. It looks like real cherry. It looks like real oak. It looks like real mahogany, but it's still just sin dressed in the veneer of Christ. Many professing believers have opted for veneer Christianity because it's so easy and it's so cheap. And they have a lot of people fooled. They look like they're passing. They look like the real deal. But the day will come when God will expose them for who they truly are. He'll take them down off of the shelf that they've been sitting on, and he will put them through the test that will expose what they are. When the stresses of life pour over them, they'll get all bent out of shape because there isn't anything real under the surface. 
They will be easily moved and swayed by the pressures of godless world because they aren't attached to anything spiritual. When they're hit with the difficult encounters, their veneer will chip away and expose the ugly sin that's still on the inside. They may be culturally relevant. They might fool the people around them, but they will never fool God because he knows that they're just carnal people covered with a veneer of Christ. But if you want to be the real thing, you have to tear out the old floor. You have to tear out the old floor. And you have to go down underneath the house to where the foundation and the footer sets. And you've got to dig in and you've got to sweat and you've got to get dirty and you've got to make that right. Then you've got to rip out the old rotted floor joists and replace them with new lumber. You got to put in a new subfloor all over the place, and then you have to get out the, the, the broom and get out the vacuum, and you have to sweep up every last bit of dirt in every corner and every nook and every cranny. And then you have to get down on your knees, and you have to sweat and pray over every piece and crucify every part of your life and sacrificially nail it into place. It's then that you'll be the real deal. From top to bottom, from the inside to the outside, you'll be Jesus Christ through and through. You can get fooled by, flooded by sickness and financial struggles and the lies of your enemies, but you won't change. You can get ran over by the attacks of the devil, but you won't be moved. You can get hit by Satan time and time again. You can get hit so hard that it knocks a chunk out of you, but when it does, it'll only expose the reality of what's inside. And what is inside is the same thing that's on the outside. Jesus crucified, risen and coming again, and you'll survive because you're the real deal. That's holiness. Evidently, there's a danger that God doesn't want his people around. In verse 5, Paul tells Timothy, when you see these veneer Christians, have nothing to do with them. That's pretty strong have nothing to do with them. He said they are the kind, verse 6, they're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. The literal interpretation here is weak women. Just as Satan first approached uh, Eve in the garden rather than Adam, these veneer Christians wind their way into the home and they persuade the women so that they can eventually influence the men. Such women are easily flattered. They're charmed by the graceful manners of religious instructors. They lend uh, a willing ear to anything that has the appearance of religion. And their hearts are open to anything that promises to advance the welfare of the world. They have leisure and they have wealth and they're busy and they move about in society. And by their activity, they obtain an influence which they are unable to obtain by their spirituality. They want to be culturally relevant. They want to be as spiritually relevant as they are socially relevant, but they want to do it without holiness. Paul says they're led away with diverse lust with various kinds of passions or desires, such as pride and vanity and the love of novelty or the susceptibility to flattery, making them an easy prey to these deceivers. It was these women that the Pharisees made their living on. He says, as Jannies and Jamborees oppose Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Jannies and Jamborees were the magicians in Pharaoh's court. When Aaron cast his rod to the ground, it turned into a serpent. Pharaoh then called for his magicians, who by sleight of hand cast their rods to the ground, and they appeared to turn into serpents as well. What Aaron did was real. But what Jannies and Jamboree's did was fake. So to prove that Aaron's snake was real, God made it slither over and eat the other two. The things that are real, God will sustain But the things that are fake, God will someday reveal. He said they, in verse 9, they will not get very far. Because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching. You know my way of life, my purpose, faith and patience and love and endurance, persecutions and sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. 
Paul said, Timothy, you know my life and you know my ministry. The truth of who Paul was had been proven by time and by trial. Timothy knew Paul's teaching. He had known how Paul lived, and he had been witness to the trials and the persecutions that Paul had endured, and yet God delivered him through all of them. The apostle Paul had been put through it all, but God used those experiences to mold him into the man he needed to be so God could declare him holy. Paul says, in fact... Everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. They'll be put through these tests. Every believer will be tried and tested, but it's not because God has abandoned them or because they aren't the real deal, but it's because God wants to prove that they are the real thing. Have you ever thought about that? Life hasn't been easy. It's been difficult for you, but the hard things that God is being allowing you to go through is the proof that you are the real deal. The testing of veneer Christians will openly prove what they truly are and will expose them to the witnessing eyes of the world. But when God's people are tested, it will reveal to all that they are Christ through and through. God's people tested and proved become holy when God declares them to be holy. It isn't something that we can attain on our own. It's beyond our ability. But God who sees into our heart and knows what we are made of, and if we are made of Christ through and through, he pronounces us as holy and molds us into the image of his Son. Our responsibility is to come into that holiness. To surrender fully to God at whatever cost so that he can make us into the Christian man or the Christian woman that we need to be and declared to be holy as he is holy. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Christians, seek holiness and not cultural relevance. Spend your time wisely by allowing the Holy Spirit to work on the inner man or the inner woman, changing you and making you holy from the inside out. It's not the easy way. The easy way is to do like the Pharisees do and just decorate the outside until you fool the people around you. Holiness isn't the easy way. Sometimes it's very difficult to make you holy as he is holy. God has to break you down to the core so he can replace the bad things in you with good things. He has to break you down. He often has to allow a mess. He has to allow you to go through the chaos and the mayhem of renovation. He has to tear out the old person you used to be. He has to fix your foundation so you're resting on a solid rock. He has to replace things in your life that are rotted and unstable so there'll be something substantial to attach the new you to. Then you have to get down on your knees and take out a hammer and nails and crucify every last piece of your life until God puts you together as he sees fit and turns you into a new creation. It's not the easy way. It's not the popular way. But it's the right way. Do you want to do it the right way? Do you want to do it God's way? Do you want to stop being fake? Do you want to stop being just religious and really be holy? Then take advantage of the opportunity that's before you today and with a submissive heart, say to God, here I am. Mold me, make me, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Do what you choose to do with me until I'm Christ through and through and you declare me to be holy as you're holy. Father, I pray today that we will react to your word. God, in so many churches, so many people go through motions. We play a part like the Pharisees. We wear the costume and we carry the equipment and we do all of the things that a good Christian is supposed to do but God on the inside we haven't changed knowing that there's a judgment coming that a woe will someday pronounce on our life if we don't get it right Father we need to make it right today and Lord I pray that we will be obedient to your Holy Spirit and open ourselves to become holy as your holy Jesus' name 
Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.